So my name is Mum Taz Yildirim La. Everyone calls me Taz, and I manage a film distribution platform called My Spotlight Independent. The company name, however, is called My Production Limited. The last time I sat with you was about six years ago, um, so it's very interesting to be able to give, have the opportunity again to talk about it. So there's been a lot of changes since the last time I saw you. Um, we now manage multiple platforms, uh, release films on all sorts of platforms. I think at the time I had an interview with you, it was just Amazon that we used to work with, but now we've branched out to so many more platforms like Google Play, Apple TV, Tubi TV in America, Plex. Amazon have given us special access to worldwide territories, so now we can deliver to Poland, Italy, Spain, France, uh, Canada for buying rent, which is a game changer because now we can get filmmakers films out literally everywhere in the world. Uh, and we've also got our own streaming, uh, streaming service now. I think when I last spoke to you, we had about 300 films on there and it was just all starting, but now we've got about a thousand films on there um, and we've just finished our Google Play app of the streaming service, which is called My Spotlight Independent Video On Demand, or MSI VOD for short. And it's basically our streaming service that you can download from the Google Play App Store. And it should also be available on the Apple App Store for all iOS devices, um, imminently, hopefully, just f fixing some technical issues with the app. At the moment, you can't see the synopsis details. You normally get a show more button. And I'm not afraid to show my flaws. <laughs> I think failure is how people succeed. And it is out there and I'm a bit annoyed because it's not functioning properly. You can't see the cast details on some of the films, so we're working on that. But the iOS version, to be able to download from the Apple App Store, is still in progress. Um, they're doing thorough checks on technical stuff. So as soon as that's approved, I'm hoping in the next month, but it has been going on for about almost a year. But it's, yeah, it's not been easy and there's a lot of money involved, but it'll be worth it. And that's, that's, that'll be a game changer. I think when that's gone live, we'll push more adverts out about the service. And who knows, another interview with you, Britflix. <laughs> so when you buy a film from our platform, um, once you've brought it, you brought it. You can log on anytime and just watch it. Um, it just works like any other platform like Amazon. You buy a film, it adds it to your library and you can see your purchases and then you can just watch it anytime. You don't have to subscribe, nothing like that. You just literally put your email in because obviously you need an email address for your receipt and you buy the film. Yeah, so you can stream it on your phone or mobile device or desktop device, PC. In some, depending on your apps and devices, you can also cast it to your, your TV in your lounge. Not all TVs will allow that, but I mean, the one at my house does. I've, I've done some testing where I can go to my Apple iPhone and I can AirPlay to the screen somehow. But at the moment, the website version's best. Uh, all of all of just the mobile. I'll type the website address, myproduction.co.uk slash VOD is the name of the, the URL link if you want to do it like that on your phone or your PC. And it works just like an actual app. But obviously, we've got the actual app as well <laughs> available to download from the app stores. So we used to offer free distribution services where the filmmaker would pay absolutely nothing uh, for the distribution service, which is still the case. We still have that option available, but they do get less percentage. So it depends on the deliverables that the filmmaker has. If they have a lot of missing elements that we have to create, we will still do that at no cost, but we'll take more percentage, which we think is quite reasonable because they don't pay anything up front. We don't recoup the cost later, we just get a bit more revenue going forward. And if the film doesn't make any money, then it's our loss. Uh, and if it does make money, then obviously we do gain, but in the long run. Um, and we offer a service where the filmmaker can pay for the distribution service and they can receive up to 90% of the revenue share, which is in their favour. And again, these revenue share splits can vary and it all depends on, you know, the film itself, what kind of deliverables that the filmmaker has. In most cases, filmmakers don't have the closed captions with the hard of hearing um, descriptions in it so for example door knocking lightning wind all those bits are sometimes missing from the subtitle file or the closed caption file if you want to because they don't really know the process they don't really know what's required um you know that's just an example one example but there's so many more things like that that we just know that we have to do and we liaise with all of that with the filmmaker up front and kind of go through everything they have and then we yeah, we'll just advise where we think we can put the film, what territories, what platforms, and then depending on their response and what they want to agree with, we'll negotiate like a revenue share split. There could be fees in some instances if they want to release their film in a, say, uh, 
in Poland, uh, say the film's English and they want to release it in Poland, we will therefore have to then localise the film into Polish. That means we'll have to translate the film into Polish. The posters will have to be Polish. Um, so th there'll obviously be a cost associated with that that we can't cover. So we charge for that if they want it. So it's we've literally expanded worldwide. There's so many options. The options are endless and every deal is different. We work with very trusted aggregators that have given us the extra reach that we need because some platforms will only work with specific companies. So we're obliged to work with the aggregators that we trust. And it's taken a lot of, um, well, uh, trial and error to find the trusted partners because there are lots of sharks out there that um, you know aren't the right company to work with. So yes, you're right. I am studying to become a lawyer at the moment. Um, if all goes well, hopefully in the next three to four years, I'll become a qualified solicitor or lawyer, however you want to say it, um, via the SQE route. It's called the Solicitor's Qualifying Examination. I've just had to meet a lot of requirements with the Solicitor's Regulation Authority, and I've been given approval to go ahead with the exam once I've done all my studies, and then hopefully if I pass, I'll have to work in a law firm as well uh, to get some experience in an actual law firm. So. Hopefully, yes, within the next four years, I'll be a solicitor. Um, and I think that will really strengthen the company. My knowledge of the film industry, I, I want to specifically uh, learn a lot more about, you know, film law, contract law, because there's a lot that I deal with naturally uh, on a day to day basis uh, regarding copyright, you know, just contracts, amending film uh, rights and territory access and intellectual property rights. There's just a lot involved and it's quite scary when you're quite a small company and you're dealing with all of that. There's a lot that I do know, but it would be nice to secure that with an actual qualification so that I've got the confidence to help advise filmmakers because there's a lot of sharks out there that will, well, that could rip you off without you realizing if you don't know or understand the contracts or exactly what it is that they're asking you to sign. Lots of hidden fees involved and working with people and I've been a victim of all of that. And I think all that frustration has led me to want to know a lot more about law and hopefully learn and help people that work with us. I've got to be careful because there's a lot of intellectual property owners out there that you know you never know. Any one of them could strike at any time. Even when you think your agreements are strong, there's no reason why they can't still put a claim against you. Um, even though the filmmaker may have signed like a warranties and indemnities section in your contract, you can still get taken to court by the claimant, um, which means then you'll have to sue for damages <laughs> to the filmmaker, like God forbid if that happens. So there's a lot of scary stuff that I've learned that I think is important for this business I I'm aware of and, and study. I've dealt with a lot of companies and third parties, like aggregators that I have to work with in order to reach certain platforms and territories because it's just the way it is. I can't personally always do everything, so I have to use third parties. and. I've signed hidden terms that I missed or hidden hidden fees that suddenly come to light when you want to make a change with something that, that you've done with them, uh, you know, and it's very frustrating because they're not normally clear with you sometimes and all they do is refer to their terms that I signed and again, a reason why I want to be a lawyer so that I can really learn what, what's right and wrong in these situations and circumstances. So. I'd always say to filmmakers to be careful what you sign, make sure there's no hidden fees, um, really make sure there's nothing up front that they're gonna you know, charge you for. Um, do they provide receipts for any so-called expenses? You know, you sign with a distributor and they might claim marketing costs for years and when you sometimes ask them for the receipts or proof of what they've been doing, they don't present it to you because as per their terms, they don't give you those details. Um, you know, there's never any transparency. I, I've, I've dealt with a lot of things like endless post-production costs that keep appearing on the reports, but I know for well, working in post-production all my life, that it won't cost £5,000 to, to deliver a film to iTunes. But then you'll see all these post-production costs for stuff that just look a bit ambiguous. And when you query them, you never really get any transparency. And it's really frustrating. And unfortunately, a lot of filmmakers will never know this because they don't know the ins and outs of the whole post-production process. They'll just assume it's the distributor's fees and that's just the way it is. But unfortunately, there is a lot of costs that are just coming out on reports. Um, and it's not normal. So I think when you negotiate a deal with a distributor, have a capped marketing spend if they do have a marketing budget that they want to spend from the royalties that they make uh, from your film. So have a check what the marketing capped spend limit is. 
Um, and also just, yeah, make sure there's no hidden fees and make sure you don't sign your film away for like 10 years. <laughs> try and have some power where you can release on platforms yourself that they can't manage. So we give everyone the flexibility to release films on platforms that uh, we can't handle and we, and we own up to it. If, if you can do that platform, you guys go ahead and do that. That's not a problem. Whereas other companies will still expect you to sign the rights away to them and it might not be on a platform for years that you could have done yourself. So again, watch out for things like that when you're dealing with other distributors and stuff. But with us, we're very honest from the beginning where, where we can put it and anything that we can't do, you can do with no restrictions. I would hope that we've normalized the divide between independent films and bigger budget films. So our mission is to put big films next to small budget films because often sometimes the small budget films are better than the big budget films and that's fact. I've seen films that I've enjoyed a lot more that are really low budget than some of the big mainstream stuff. And I think the whole point of our platform is to prove that by literally not being afraid to put a really gritty low budget looking film next to a really incredible big movie style looking film. Um, and let the customer decide you know, what they want to watch. Give them the opportunity to see those low budget films amongst some of the big budget films just so that it looks normal and feels normal to just select something that looks interesting from the trailer or the synopsis and not just be pushed the big stuff at the top. So I want to become recognised um, as the platform for that face. So anyone who buys a film from our platform will contribute to that mission which is to normalise that divide. And at the moment every single film is one pounds. Some people might think that's cheap. Well, is the film gonna, is the filmmaker going to make any money? Well, absolutely. Imagine a lot of people without mind spending a pound on a film. I did a little survey. Would you be willing to spend a pound on a film that looks good if it's not on any other platform? And literally all of them pretty much said no problem. Like I wouldn't. I, I would happily spend one pound to watch a film if I like the look of the trailer. Um, and if it's 50-50 split, the filmmaker will get 50p, as opposed to the half a penny that you would get for one hour streaming of a film nowadays on an AVOD platform, because these AVOD platforms are paying not even half a p. Like the, the way it calculates the minutes streamed works out at like a quarter of a p, half a p, and they all have their different rates. Um, so I personally think if a filmmaker gets 50p from the film on my site, like can you imagine, like if it did, if, 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 you're, if a filmmaker's film took a hold on our site, and that was the only platform that was re it was released on exclusively, they could make some, some significant income like that. And that's where I want the platform to be. I want it to be the new supporter of independent film. And there are a lot of competitors who also have streaming services, who are also, who do, do have some great independent content, but they're normally subscription services or they're also AWOD based. Anyone respectful enough who actually appreciates independent films would be happy to contribute to that uh, that idea. So that's kind of what I want to push out there. So that's where I think I'll be in five years, um, pushing that whole, normalizing that divide. So there's so many apps and devices nowadays um, in the world, as you will probably know, and, and service types such as advertisement video on demand, transactional video on demand, subscription video on demand. There's all these services and apps and devices that, and it's getting really complicated and there's just so many. And I think it's changed in that respect. And it's good for the filmmakers because they've got all these apps and devices accessible now where they can release their own films. Um, so to a certain extent, filmmakers can monetize their own content. They can create their own website via their website provider, create their own app using companies like Vimeo, who I believe offer app services. And they're releasing their own content now, which, which is brilliant. Um, so that's like one of the biggest changes. However, to manage that and really understand how it all works is very different. So that's why obviously we offer our services because we're very transparent with our filmmakers. We know how the industry works from an app point of view, the type of services out there, which territories will allow the specific apps and VOD platforms out there. So it's a game changer, all these different service types and apps. I still feel the same about film festivals. I think last time I said to you that I wasn't too keen on film festivals because I've got evidence from filmmakers that say to me, we'll come back to you and sign a distribution deal with you uh, after we've done the film festival circuit. Two years later, they've come back to us and they haven't had any successful sales as a result of the film festival. Um, so we'll release it for them. So effectively, they've wasted two years trying to kind of maybe get that big deal at the film festival. 
um, whereas we could have released it two years ago and they could have been earning passive income. So I'm not saying film festivals are bad or anything like that and I do feel that if you can get into some of the big film festivals I absolutely would recommend that but there's quite a lot of independent ones and smaller film festivals nowadays that are of course great and if you want the exposure um, and you want to get laurels on your film poster and give it the exposure that it, it deserves I think film festivals are great but if you're expecting to get that big sale uh, then have, have a think about it because you could be wasting a lot of time just doing the festival circuit, paying for film festivals, but then at the end of it, you'll get the distribution deal that we would have given you anyway two years ago. So it depends what you want out of it. But for me as a filmmaker, I've done a few film festivals and I've always found that it just took a lot of time, uh, resources, meeting people, a lot of fake people as well. <laughs> and I just get it onto the platform as soon as I can. So I haven't been to many big events or film festivals recently because I've been so busy with getting films onto the platforms and actually working with the filmmakers directly to get their content published. Um, as much as I would love to go to a lot of these events, something always holds me back and it's the arrogance of the people. I've met quite a lot of people in the industry that are quite fake to your face, unfortunately. And it's all about the holding their champagne and looking all swift and big for everyone else but really when you actually come to deal with them on email or when you submit films to them or offer partnership they never respond but when you see them face to face it's all oh hello how are you and there's just always this arrogance about it and I can't deal with that so I'd much rather get my head down and actually get the films published for the filmmakers and that's what we're about we focus on actually being responsive to the filmmakers um, very transparent and anything that they don't have um, as part of their film elements like the trailer or posters, we would create all of those uh, at our cost, um, depending on the distribution deal, and create the closed captions as well that's necessary for releasing in the USA. And we're just liaise with the filmmaker, exactly what needs to be done to get the film onto the platform. So that's probably why I haven't really focused on going to a lot of the events and film festival markets as much. I think a lot of the platforms, like the bigger platforms, are still wanting films with big named actors in it, yes, because to this day I, I still try and pitch the odd film that comes through that I feel is like a really big VOD platform worthy film. Um, and I always get a response with, there's no one named in it or they, they want cast driven films and I've got those exact words in various emails from various big buyers. Um, once I had a, an email saying that they only accept films more than five million. <laughs> so when they saw the budget of the film that I was presenting to them, they didn't even look at it. So I do have evidence of that. Um, I even have evidence of filmmakers saying, can you pitch to so-and-so? Can you pitch to so-and-so? Because we tried and we can't hear and we do pitch. Sometimes we get a response, sometimes we don't. And then sometimes when we do get a response, it's the whole cast driven thing. So the answer to that question is yes, I believe they do. However, they are clocking onto the fact slowly that because of the uh, number of apps and devices that, that are out there um, and people releasing their own content and they're getting the recognition that it deserves, they are starting to be, to be a bit more lenient with the lower budget stuff. Like sometimes on a big VOD platform, you will get suddenly an independent film that's kind of at the top, but only because it's probably raised a lot of noise and it's got to be something that's raised a lot of noise for a platform to really want it. Um, unless you know someone in the industry or you'll just become really lucky. It's <laughs> just a good meeting a good person at the right time, right place as well. I believe there's a lot of that as well. I think the DVD market will eventually die. And that's what I think. I could be wrong, but I mean, we hardly get any requests for DVD um, deals, um, but that's because we don't really handle it. So I can't speak for the companies that do. However, what of a sales agent that said to me that he still very much believes in the DVD market. There's quite a high demand for it in the States in particular because there's so many remote areas in still quite a lot of the world. So I would imagine some stores do want to hold DVDs and Blu-rays. Um, so it's not dead yet, but I do think eventually it will because the whole world has gone digital and eventually those remote areas will probably get some form of VOD platform service somewhere along the line. Yes, you get the odd fi film out of maybe 10, one in 10, two in 10 could make a significant amount of income. Suddenly, unexpectedly, with marketing or without, we've got so much data that suggests it's all about initial algorithms. So when you release a film on say Amazon, how many people can you, the filmmaker, get from your family, friends, everyone involved in the film to actually go onto Amazon, 
buy it, rent it, comment, review it on IMDb. It's all linked. The algorithms are linked. If you can manage, if you manage to do that initially, that naturally kicks it into a, like an algorithm boost, and that's what it's become nowadays. Like, it's not spending thousands of pounds on posters on buses like they used to when it was all theatrical releases, followed by Blu-ray and then DVD and then DVD. It's all because, like I said, there's so many apps and devices out there. It's hard to make lots of money because everyone's selective of what app they want to watch or where they want to watch it. You know, some people watch a film on Netflix because they have the subscription. They don't want to pay anywhere else. So you've already lost maybe a customer from just people watching stuff on Netflix or or vice versa on Amazon. Um, it's, uh, there are a lot of independent films on those platforms as well, but you often have to scroll quite far down to find those good independent ones. It's only when a friend recommends to me, oh, you've got to watch this film on Netflix or Amazon, and it's one that I would never have seen at the top of the list. It's like, you have to search for it. <clears throat> um, I mean, that's from my experience anyway. I'm, I'm gonna try not to do that because I'll just fall into the whole, everyone else, it's just, this, that's what seems to be what's happening, and I just wanna try and avoid that as long as I can handle. <clears throat> um, if I can stay strong with what I believe, um, you know, if everybody wants to make, if, if the filmmakers want to make money, then the creative people and people watching films will hopefully appreciate from the description of the VOD channel, what it's all about, they'll contribute to, to the filmmaker that's <laughs> sweat and blood into making the film, you know? <clears throat> It'll be hard, it's not gonna be easy, uh, but that'll be the aim. Uh, otherwise, I'm not closed off to SVOD or AVOD event, you know, if it has to be like that. But for now, we just wanna keep it very simple. It's really simple for reporting. You just know exactly what you get from the pound and that's it. There's none of this, oh, you're going to get a quarter of a P for that viewing when you could have got a pound or 50p, depending on the revenue share split. <clears throat> At the moment, in this moment in time, on Amazon, you can get home cinema films, I believe, where you pay up to 19.99 or £20 to, to watch a film that's just been released from a major studio company. I watched a great horror on there the other day called... Uh, um, Thanksgiving. <laughs> it was very violent and right up my street. And I enjoyed it. I mean, it was £20, but I wanted to watch a good horror. And again, it got me in a moment, at the right moment. I saw, again, Amazon's algorithm kick in. Had an email that says, we think you would like this title. This is because I've watched horror films before. The system knows that I like horror, so it put that towards me. <clears throat> and I like the trailer. I watched the trailer, I like the trailer, and I paid for it. And some people will never do that. They'll never want to pay a 20 quid for a film. But if you think of it this way, you've got a nice setup at home. You've got five people that can watch it for 20 quid. You go to cinema, you've got to each pay 20 quid. And obviously cinema's a great experience and we love cinema and I don't ever want cinema to die. But for that reason, it, it's quite worth it. If you've got lots of friends around and you want to buy the one-off 20 quid film on Amazon, I think it's totally worth it. Um, but it is a lot of money. <laughs> it's quite a lot of money now. And that never used to be like that, did it at VOD? Like, not that, not that much money. <clears throat> so it's very interesting how many different options there are that even starting to bring cinema to VOD. But they just call it cinema because it's just a new release. I could call my film cinema if I wanted to. But I think to have it on that actual service type, Amazon will have had to have made a proper studio deal to do that. I don't think they'll take indies and put it under the home cinema for 20 quid unless they've made the direct special deal for that section. <laughs> so it's endless. I mean, there's something called... Um, ASVOD now, which is Advertisement Subscription Video On Demand now, which is just, it's gone, it's gone really ridiculous now, to be honest with you. It's, it's subscription channels that were free to watch with no ads that now have adverts. I believe Netflix have introduced a cheaper service to have adverts because they probably realized, um, without speaking negative, negatively of them, because that's the way the industry is going, other platforms have it's competitive it's a competitive market and i think because other platforms are doing free films with some adverts they have to do stuff like that otherwise they're going to lose customers that's what i believe anyway uh, and amazon has introduced as well the as vod uh, there was a big email that went out from amazon to everybody saying we're still going to put some trailers in your subscription model that you pay for prime which is but which has not been interfering with the film really it's just at the beginning of the film before it even starts they put a trailer i've noticed now which is fine because I do believe the industry is growing and they have to make money and they've got to keep the service going and I want Amazon to keep the service going. I love working with them. 
So it's understandable, but I can understand for the customer it's a bit frustrating and confusing because now all of a sudden they'll have adverts in the films that they originally paid for to hopefully have no adverts. And I think you can actually pay a bit more to not have the advert. So they've still kept that in, but with an additional few pounds more or something like that. <clears throat> and that's this moment in time. This, this might change after this interview, but. <laughs> I've had a query from many friends and people in the business who said to me, you can't just, you can't just uh, acquire rubbish on your platforms, you've still got to put up some kind of credible films. And that's exactly what we do, like we don't just take on any old rubbish. If the story's there and it's quite gripping enough to, to keep an audience, <clears throat> we, will take, we will take it and if we can fix it to make it compliant enough for our channel, we will put it on there because at the end of the day, I think every single filmmaker struggles to get a film made. It's really difficult to make a film, even with a budget or without, and I feel that they deserve having their content released. But like I said, we do review every film that comes in and we do have to meet a certain type of quality. You know, if it's really bad, like compressed quality, then we just can't take it because, you know, it's not good because customers still don't want to watch a really bad quality film. But if the, if the quality looks good and the story's good, but it looks like a low budget one. Like, I don't know, like a, you know, the paranormal activities, the way they're filmed, like those horror films with the cameras all set up around the house, not really good quality. But again, if it keeps you engaged enough, we will say yes to it. Um, and then we will say yes to the big films because we want the big films to complement the little ones and vice versa. Like it's important that, that we work with each other, like the high budget films and the small budget films. So I'll keep going on about, um, everybody wanting big budget films and cast driven films of course I would love those on my platform too and that's the aim I do want to get those big platforms but I never want to shy away from putting the smaller ones up when when I do achieve that because I will, I will fail my mission and my goal I don't want to end up being just like every other VOD platform where we'll forget the small ones just because we're getting the big ones and I want to always maintain that level of uh, reassurance for the indies to make the filmmaker happy to develop a trusted relationship and they've gone away, they've gone away and made more films, learnt from the first one, and brought back some really good, uh, good stuff. Like a second film that's a lot, and I can see the quality is so much better. And they've learnt a lot, and I've advised them of like what to fix and about the sound. You know, some of the sound weren't quite smooth in cuts. So like I've just I've been experimental, and I've gone back and I've said on your next one, fix this, fix that. Make sure you have consistent color color grading. Like the shots look the same when you cut from angle to angle. And um, they've taken that on board and they've learned a lot and, they've, and they still give me films to this day. And sometimes they're films to make quite a bit of money, unexpectedly. So I don't ever judge and I just stand strong with what I believe. People don't like it, they can laugh off. <laughs> That's how I see it. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Really enjoyed being interviewed by Britflix today. Um, I was a bit nervous to be fair. I often prefer being behind the camera, um, but I think it's important for everybody to know my mission and my goal uh, and for the success of the company. This is why I spoke to Britflix today, so thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it.